better or whatever, but you're all living, so I know that you're an expert breather, you know? So once you take that premise, things get as natural as that, it starts to set up. Now there's reasons we can't get to that. The, the one that people cite the most is talent. It is the province of a few, but not others. And I found that not to be true. I found that there can be very talented people that cannot get to that place. And that there are people who with a really organized, incremental, patient process can get further than people might have got. The only thing talent refers to is the ease with which you attain something. Yeah, some people, you know, sorry, it's not a fair life, you know. They, they think about it a little bit and they're playing their ass off for it, you know. But there's no domain that anybody can't get to. Bill Evans always insisted he wasn't that talented. But he practiced in such an incremental, conscious, and patient way. This is, this is why, you know. I remember we were at his birthday party, and I wrote about this in the book, and he said, someone said, Bill, what do you practice? He said, without skipping a beat, he said, I practice the minimum. Oh. And, you know, you can interpret that several ways, but I knew exactly what he was saying. The minimum amount of material at that moment, so I could gain complete ownership over it. And if I do that several times, like drops in a bucket, <clears throat> I'm creating a player that plays completely perfect phrases, which is what his discography tells us, you know? It's so easy to play or hear in a vague way, and the vagarity of it comes from skipping things. So one of the reasons we don't reach that thing is because we don't wait for the body to learn how to play the instrument, even if the voice. Vocalists have such an agenda from the start of going to school for vo vocal, it's like the affectation is more important than the actual person's voice. Is it jazz, you know, like, which I still can't get why that's important, you know, but for anybody, it should be something that someone's sensually drawn to. And it's something that can be taught, but if one loses their own sense of their voice in order to be a jazz singer, they've gained a style and they've lost everything else. You know, so that's an example. Now you get into the psychological thing. What, why do we have better performances and worse performances? And why can't we train on the level that induces mastery? So I usually start any kind of effortless mastery discussion with this basic question to students or anybody. Think about a time when everything was on the line, you really felt like you needed to play good. How do you play? <laughs> you know, it's a pretty common answer, right? Now think about you're just fooling around and you didn't think it was important or you had no expectations or you were playing with people you love or trust or we're old enough to notice you're playing a wedding and absolutely nobody's listening. How do you play that? You know, for some reason there was no consequences and you played better. This is the foundation <coughs> of the psychological aspect of effortless mastery. So, well, I'll tell people then and say, okay, well, I didn't see anybody nod, but do you agree that those times when it's, you're thinking it's so important you play well, that you have trouble playing or singing? Yeah. yeah. And then you agree about the opposite? Mm -hmm. Well, you're all, you know, wonderfully aware, intelligent people. Now that I've shown you that, you're never going to care again, right? <laughs> oh, boy, we can stop right now. <laughs> all these years, I thought I could get there by caring. I thought that's what it was. If I just beat myself up enough, I will be inspiring to the masses. Oh, I, he's right. The more I beat myself up, the harder it is to do it. So now I'll never do that again. And that's why the next thing we do is laugh. Because even if you know that's true, that realization will stay with you for about five notes before you're back in there trying to sound good. You know? So the irony of it, the cruel joke of it, or whatever you want to call it, is that the need to sound good is usually the biggest block if I'm actually sounding good. And not needing to sound good you know, leaves the other option, which is enjoying what you're doing. You know? So we start to talk about it. Now, now the process of effortless mastery unrolls from that realization. Okay, I know that by not doing it, I have a richer experience. Now I just went and played it. It's like we never said that. I'm carrying it. So what do I do? And why do I do that? Because the brain is programmable. Is it a muscle or a whatever? It's a programmable 
mass of something or other, and you're already programmed to do something, that is the whole foundation of addiction. Yeah, I don't want to do that anymore. Oh, it's two hours later, I'm doing it, you know? Um, the brain is programmable, and if you program the care, then you get a care, even though you've now realized that caring makes you play worse. So now it's about what can we do to reprogram? Not just talk about it philosophically, which is fun and stimulating, but it doesn't change anything. I've heard eloquent lectures on this subject by people who, if they played, it would have just negated everything they just said. <laughs> you know, Because they're not doing it. But it sounds wonderful. Anything to be attained, especially a reprogramming of the brain, takes a practice of some sort. You know, And then the other thing to I like to get into before we even talk about the practice is why can't we let go? Why can't we sound bad? Does anybody want to venture an answer to that? Why can't you just let yourself sound bad? Ego. We don't want to. Well, that's it right there. The ego, you know. I mean, does anybody have an actual, like, uh, Noble reason they think that they're not letting us down bad. Okay, you went right to the answer. Yeah. Because we compare ourselves to the masters. To the masters? Well. <laughs> or or the one in the next room, or or one of your students. Yeah. 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 I tell you the truth, it's not good to compare yourself to the masters. <laughs> if I sit down to play and the words Herbie Hancock go through my mind. That's not a good idea. That's not a good thought. You know? Or Keith Jarrett Barton, not very bad. Thought. Well, it's so much part of us that if you sound bad, you're a bad person. Right. Right. And we learned that. If we hadn't learned it before, we certainly learned it by going to school. <laughs> you know, so I wrote a thing that Roger quoted in, in uh, he wrote the introduction of my, we did a 20th anniversary of the book, you know. And I have a thing called, uh, 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 it's called uh, MSD, which you don't want to contract if you, if you get MSD. It's, it's music school disease. <laughs> and if you get music school disease lasting more than four hours, you screw your psychiatrist. <laughs> no, I mean, what is music school disease? Music school disease is this. You're playing a nice, comfortable phrase that you understand and you hear and feels good, and a little voice goes off in your head, it's not burning. <laughs> It's not traditional enough. It's not authentic. It's not swinging. By the way, if you ever ask yourself the question, are you swinging? You already have your answer. <laughs> <laughs> you ask the question, you already have your answer. But a little voice goes up in your head, that has to be better. So the question is, what's wrong with that? If that made you play better, then I'd recommend it. But usually after that little voice goes up in your head, you have a moment where you burn harder or whatever it is you're trying to do, you, you respond to it for about a moment, and then it's sort of like, you know, that scene late in the movie, uh, Titanic. You know, your solo gets better for a second, and it's sort of like, you know, remember when the thing broke off first, it was like, it was like. <laughs> then it does this. <laughs> 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 That's otherwise known as the lad, lad, latter third of your solo. You <laughs> <laughs> should stop. Yeah. Well, let's talk about it. In your book, we talk about you're playing in a club and you're grooving and you're swinging. And Cedar Walton walks in. Right. And he's like, you know, and, and you fall apart. Right, or even less stimulus than that. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, it's a habit we get into, if we weren't into it before we got here, the habit we get into in school. And it's so common in every school that it's gotta be, if we knew a percentage on it, it would be truly frightening. And yet, nobody has any language to talk about. And what's happening here is someone called my bluff, because I'll go to a school and I'll talk about this, and I do some exercises, which have to do with reprogramming, the mind to touch the instrument without caring. If you can't even touch the instrument without going into that self-esteem mode, then this is just Remain's philosophy. Good to talk about over a good cup of coffee. That's it. If you don't practice, touch, you know, I touch this table, I don't I don't value myself as an artist by how I touch this table. Therefore I'm free. 
So what I try to do, well, I don't try to do it, but sorry, decades of doing the same thing here. You know, this is my playground. touch the instrument without that immediate <coughs> jerk reaction of self-criticism, which has been learned. So the good news is you can unlearn it. The bad news is it's a bitch to do. You have to have an exercise that you repeat a lot until you get comfortable with you as the person that doesn't do that. So the first reason that we, and, and this, this thing doesn't just block your playing, it blocks your practicing. It ruins your playing by what I just said, inducing doubt in the middle of what you're doing. So you need to program to love what you're doing, not because that has such a nice kumbaya sound to it, but as a strategy. If you want the thing to flow, then practice loving what you're playing. And, and when you're practicing it, that means when you stop loving it, you take your hands off the instrument. You're not practicing music, you're practicing connecting effortlessly with the instrument. And the only way to do that is to imagine Every sound you make is the most beautiful sound you've ever heard. It is a brainwashing, a positive brainwashing.